Hey all, welcome back. We're taking a look at chapter seven of our text. Once again, we're thinking about classroom management, more specifically thinking about learning environments and ways to uh, scaffold learners in those environments and structure our learning environments so that we can support all learners. As we take a look at chapter seven, we're going to take uh, a look at motivation. We're going to think about mindsets, fixed and growth mindsets. We're going to think about brain based learning and how that impacts what is happening or could happen in our classroom. As we think about this, we want to make sure that we recognize the fact that just because words come out of our mouths doesn't mean that students will automatically listen and learn to what we have to say. We know there's numerous contexts and contingencies that interfere with or modify the ways that students learn. These might impact either positively or negatively the way that students take in information that we're sharing. Uh, students might be more willing or less willing to listen to what we have to say based upon their thoughts and feelings about the content, uh, their thoughts and feelings about us. Um, they might be more will or more or less than willing to uh, learn about content based upon whether or not they believe that they can be successful in that content. Um, so we think about self-efficacy, self-actualization. We also want to think about motivation. Do learners believe that they uh, can be successful and are, are they motivated to engage with the content and engage with you? So when we talk about motivation, it's somewhat of a challenging topic to talk, talk about because we all have varying um, expectations of what motivation may mean. Motivation generally is a relationship between an expectation, a value, and the climate. So we, we have this expectation about whether or not we can be successful in a content area or in an environment. We uh, think about the value that we place in this work. And last but not least, we think about the climate. We think about the, the environment. We think about the, the social and cultural structures in and around this. And so generally students ask questions about, can I do this or not? Um, they ask questions in terms of value about, do I want to do this? And uh, lastly, they might ask questions about, am I safe here? Am I safe doing this? Um, and we've talked about safety um, and students uh, sort of evaluating uh, the, the risk award in any situation in previous chapters. We also want to consider mindset. Um, we want to recognize the fact that intelligence is something about you. It is a quantifiable sum that you really cannot change. Um, and, or we view intelligence as something that you can always change. You can always, uh, you know, uh, change how much intelligence you have. Um, we also want to think about your mindset as an educator. Um, do you do things differently, but the important parts of who you are really can't be changed, or you can change basic things about who you are. So generally what we're looking at is your mindset as an educator. Do you believe generally on the left-hand side of the screen that for the most part, you are who you are. You have what you have. You can't really make any difference in that. Or are you on the right-hand side of the screen and you believe that for the most part, you can change things about yourself, uh, you know, that you can learn new skills, you can learn new hobbies or habits or practices. Um, so you want to think about where you lie on this continuum. Are you more on the left side of things or on the right side of things? When we read uh, researchers like Carol Dweck, we think about uh, fixed or growth mindset. We think about the different ways that we attribute that and then we use it. So if we think about growth and mindset and fixed mindset, on the left we'll have the fixed mindset, on the right we'll have the growth mindset. So on the left we basically would, would, we would consider that intelligence and other traits are generally static. What you have is what you have. You can't really add on to it. Whereas on the right we think that they're more malleable, um, that they are uh, a bit plastic. They are something that can bend and grow and expand and also we can contract them as well. When we think about traits, we think from a fixed mindset that traits cannot really be changed with effort. Uh, generally, traits are what we have and they will always stay that way. Whereas from a growth mindset, from a growth perspective, we would consider that with effort, practice, preparation, 
um, that we can change these and make a difference. We think about um, success. From a fixed point of view, success depends on innate ability. You are, uh, you have certain innate uh, traits, you have certain innate abilities, and therefore your level of success is dependent on, and it is all due to that innate ability. From a growth mindset, we basically look at this as a, a indication of your willingness to invest time, energy, effort into uh, the new task and into being successful. So once again, it's, it's a, a framing. Are we coming at this with a fixed or a growth mindset? As we expand this, there are, I believe, more important uh, ways that fixed or growth mindsets impact the way that we teach, the way that students learn, and the interaction between those two. Um, as an example, mistakes. Many times we don't want to fail in the classroom. Uh, part of a fixed mindset on the left is that mistakes are something we generally avoid. Whereas on the right hand side of this, we look at a growth mindset, a growth mindset perspective generally um, values mistakes. And it's part of the learning process. And we're thankful that we made a mistake so that we can learn and we can restructure or redo or revise our habits and our practices. Um, Satisfaction from a, a fixed mindset is generally related to success. Um, we see the teacher mainly as a judge um, in a fixed mindset. Um, if we want substantive and actionable feedback, we generally um, see that as being growth mindset. Um, if we learn a task to appear smarter to classmates, um, most likely a fixed mindset. Um, and once again, ability is static, generally is a fixed mindset. Um, so the, the gray area one is that substantive and actionable feedback on the left-hand side. We, if we look at that, that could be a growth mindset where a student wants to learn in order to improve, but it depends on the, the rationale or the volition involved in it. On the right-hand side, views mistakes as part of the learning process, that's growth mindset views the teacher as a guide. Once again, that's a growth mindset, a growth perspective, seeks feedback that is flattering. I would say that is a fixed mindset. Um, so believes ability develops over time, um, could be fixed or growth. If we're putting in the effort, I would say it's growth mindset. If it's just, I am older, so I have uh, more ability, I would say that's a fixed mindset. Satisfaction is related to progress, I would say that is also a fixed mindset. Um, and then learning a task solely for the purpose of improvement might be growth mindset. It might be a student trying to improve or an individual trying to improve themselves. So if we think about what this uh, looks like in our classroom, we want to think about a growth or an effort mindset and how to encourage that and, and foster that thought process in our classroom. Uh, first thing we want to do is identify and build on student strengths. We want to think about zone approximable development in ZPD and think about um, Lev Vygotsky and a mindset about challenges or intellectual risks and uh, scaffolding students that they can be successful in these risks and move to automaticity. Um, in a growth or an effort mindset, we want to not just permit, but we want to provide students with opportunities to have failure without penalty. Um, so generally have a low risk or a low bar um, for failure uh, and, and, and not really using it to penalize students. Far too often we think about our classrooms and the grade is the end all be all, but really um, it should be learning more, failing more and learning from failure um, but the challenge is that because we invest so much in, in terms of time and finances and other things and emotional uh, capital, I mean, since we invest so much in it, we don't really want to fail um, and we definitely don't want to be penalized for this. A growth or an effort mindset generally is using rewards sparingly because rewards for reward's sake gen is not a, a, uh, a component really of a growth or effort mindset where generally you, you know, the reward is learning and, and taking on new tasks. 
Um, and we're going to think about locus of control. I want to think about how much impact does a student have on their own personal success, how much do they have on the personal success, uh, on the class success, uh, and how much control does the teacher have in these spaces. So one way to build up a growth mindset is to have questioning or prompts. Um, and these are very simple statements that you can pretty much repeat over and over and over. Um, I've seen classes where these are put up on posters in the, in the room and the teacher just points at the, the question and doesn't even bother to ask them anymore because we're ingraining these questions or these thought processes in our students. So generally, what did you learn today? What could you have done differently? Uh, what would you do differently next time? Uh, what did, what do you know now that you wish you would have known, known before we started this activity? Uh, what did you give your all today? How did you show your best work today? Um, what questions do you still have? What information do you not have in order to answer this question? What additional information do you need to approach this task? So it's always sort of problematizing the, the processes involved in, uh, the work that we do in our classroom. When we're in the classroom, students need opportunities for success early and often. We want to build up uh, that capital. We want to uh, build up their self-esteem and we want to provide them with some small, easy wins so they can feel better about themselves and move on to harder and more challenging things. We also want to provide feedback at regular intervals. We want to have them monitor their progress as well. Um, rubrics are a good way to do this so that students can see what it is that you are looking for and, and try and figure out how they stack up and how they can improve. Um, we want to encourage the effort. Um, a lot of our classes, not enough of our classrooms are effort based. Um, we only look at ability. So the student could get something wrong and we generally say, you know, thank you for sharing. Um, what if we restructure this? Would someone else like to help assist with this answer? Or maybe this is a different viewpoint that we haven't considered. So we're, we're really valuing effort in the classroom, not just the scores, not just right or wrong. Um, if we are wrong, but we put in good effort, that's probably more valuable than just, um, that, that A plus on the test. So when we think about motivation in the classroom, we want to think about the, the number of elements that are involved in the classroom that speak to the student. Um, one of the things that we want to do is think about our own uh, identity and perspective in the classroom. Are we excited to be there or do we give off this vibe to students that we are miserable and there's about 50 other places that we would rather be? Um, we want to give students praise uh, when they earn it, we want to recognize uh, hard work and effort and give them praise when we see it. We possibly want to allow students to work together and collaborate so that they can give each other praise and support and they can learn from one another. We want to get to know our students and figure out who they are, what types of human beings they are. Uh, we want to have a threat free environment and we want to routinely change the scenery. This could be leaving the classroom and going to other places. This could be rearranging the classroom. This could be rearranging the uh, seating uh, charts and seating patterns in the classroom or the workflow in the classroom. Mix things up. Uh, and the last two things we want to make things fun. And we want to, to give students a sense of control. We want students to feel like they are a part of this. No student will want to go into an environment and uh, succeed or work for you if they don't believe that they can succeed. It is not motivating if they don't believe that they have a voice in the environment. If they feel like they're doing things just for you or jumping through hoops, that is going to uh, erase the motivation that any of us would have in any environment. So a little fact or fiction. Uh, we learn better when we receive information in a preferred learning style. There's this belief that there are such things as learning styles and that if you get something in your preferred learning style, then you learn better um, or it's easier for you to uh, gather this information. Um, we know that this is not true. We know that on a regular basis, we, our brains, um, either... Uh, actively or subconsciously, we use visual, auditory, bodily kinesthetic, all sorts of information streams 
all sorts of styles of learning when we process new information. Some of those things we pay more attention to, some of those things um, we uh, believe that we like better, but there's no um, best uh, recipe for learning based upon learning style. We also look at differences in hemispheric dominance, meaning left side, right, you know, right brain, left brain, that sort of thing. Differences in hemispheric dominance can help explain individual differences amongst learners. There's this mindset that, well, I'm left brain, so I operate this way, or that person does these things, so they are right brained. Um, that is also not true. Our right and left hemispheres constantly communicate. They're constantly making sense of the environment around us. They're constantly exchanging information um, to help us make sense of external stimuli and make sense of the world. Um, sometimes they do this rather well with each other and other times they struggle, um, but we're talking about brain pathways. Speaking of brain pathways, uh, generally we only use 10% of our brain. Um, Fiction, once again, we have about 100 billion active neurons. Messaging is endless and infinite. Um, one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that our brain is always growing. Um, there is There was old science that suggested that, you know, an old dog cannot learn new tricks. There was this old mindset that, for the most part, your brain matures up to a certain point and then you sort of stop, your brain cells stop forming. We know that that is not true. The truth of the matter is that uh, we have a, a concept known as synaptogenesis, which is healthy, grain, uh, healthy brain cell formation. Um, and what happens is as brain cells form, uh, the, the dendrites uh, reach out and we have synaptic clefts that basically form the basis of thought. And as we uh, use a process more often, as we learn a content area more often, as we go through a skill more often, as we repeat and repeat and repeat and practice something, what will happen is the sheath here will myelinate and it will get like a fatty insular, um, you know, coating to it. And we grow more dendrites, which basically is in effect learning. So the, the, the purpose of this area is if you have students that don't initially get something, we should try, try again and practice those behaviors. The brain really is a, a an incredible tool. It's an incredible uh, organ uh, that guides most of the thought and cognition in our body. It's sometimes a challenge to see how that connects to what happens in the classroom. For my purposes, Anytime I do anything in the classroom, I begin with thinking about the synapse. I begin thinking about the neurons and start with the smallest, infinitesimally small area of thought. I think about electrotransmitters firing across the synapses in our brain and those linked together to form uh, almost like thunderstorms that form thought and then influence action um, and reaction in our bodies. One of the areas that this leads to is brain-based learning. Uh, brain-based learning is the connection between neuroscience and education. We believe that learning is physiological, meaning movement, social, safety, and emotion focused, uh, meaning that stress plays a key role. We believe that learning is related to patterns. Uh, the brain generally makes sense through patterns. Uh, we use those patterns to make sense of the world. We use those patterns to express what we've learned to others or present it to others. Um, and generally, we speak in a language of patterns. We see the same thing occurring in computer code. Um, so some of brain-based learning takes its influence from computer science, where a lot of uh, the logic, a lot of the language in computer science is based upon patterns and creating those patterns and using those patterns to explain things to other uh, computers. So one of the principles in this is that learning a new skill is easier when it's related to something we already know. When we learn something new, we either assimilate that information or we accommodate that information. If we assimilate it, we basically say, I already know something sort of like this, and I can put this in that area of my brain that contains that information. 
So if I am baking something new, I might uh, think about the fact that I haven't baked this specific recipe, but I've baked in general or I've baked other recipes like this. So I can take what I know from that other area and uh, make it apply here. So I can assimilate that information. Accommodation is when we learn something new that we've no basis of comparison and our brain has to really stretch to make a new area. What this means for our classroom is we want to activate prior knowledge. We want to help students relate new content to stuff they already know. So that's why as we begin a new area, we begin a new uh, section, a new theme, a new unit, a new chapter. What we want to do is connect that, the basics of the chapters, to content that students already know. And then as they learn the new content, they can connect the new to the known. Uh, this makes us think about scaffolding, as I mentioned before, and zone and proximal development and some of the work by Vygotsky and others. This also uh, makes us think about mind mapping. Uh, there are several great tools online like Coggle and MindMeister where you can sort of map out ideas in a chapter or ideas in a unit. We think about spiral curriculums. So we're starting with new initial uh, content and revising our thoughts and understanding about it and uh, sort of building up to mastery or automaticity. And last but not least, when we think about relating new content to what students already know. That's why we think about KWL charts, um, it, what a student knows, wants to know, and what they've learned at the end of a unit. Principle two, the more curious, and this is still in brain-based learning, the more curious we are about a topic, the easier it is to learn info. Um, so when students figure out something, they are rewarded, their brain rewards it, and they experience uh, uh, pleasure, euphoria, they, they are excited and rewarded for the struggle. Um, and so that brings about more curiosity because the brain is seeking more dopamine um, into the system. So generally, if we uh, put out a question, an ill-formed question for students, they might be a little bit more curious as to what's happening and that might uh, cause them to strive a little bit more, be more motivated to figure out what the response is so that they can get that dopamine hit so that they can feel reward and be motivated. Um, and uh, that also improves um, the ways in which they persevere or they are flexible um, when they come across future ill-suited problems. So as an example, Paul's height and six feet, uh, Paul's height is six feet, sorry. He's an assistant at the butcher shop and wears size nine shoes. Uh, what does he weigh? Um, so we're trying to make sense of what is the answer? Where is this information coming from? What is the content that we know? What's the information we don't know? What do we need to know to answer this? So we're building in a sort of roadblock for students so we can inspire curiosity. What does this mean in our classroom? Um, one of the ideas was it, it is to give them a hook. One of the ideas here is to get students interested, um, make students, uh, not make them, uh, try and hook them into the upcoming unit or theme or section or chapter. Um, you know, get them excited about what they're about to learn, have a question that they really are inspired by. Um, we see some of this in project-based learning where we have a driving question that is overarching. We also see opportunities to in include novelty. Um, so we have illustrations, we have graphic novels, we have character assumptions, we have other ways to make learning new and once again fun. There are ways to motivate based upon brain-based brain learning uh, perspectives where we challenge students by including debates, games. Uh, in our science classes, we can have experiments and we stop right before the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, reaction uh, and ask students to hypothesize what they think will happen. Um, we also can motivate students as influenced by brain-based learning by confusing them. Um, we are bringing in some uh, cognitive dissonance and trying to make students think about 
um, the content and learn more by giving them a riddle and challenging them or confusing them, giving them once again those ill-formed problems. So you might say you're running a race, you pass the person in second place, what place are you? Uh, the manufacturer doesn't need it, the buyer doesn't want it, and the user doesn't know that he's using it, what is it? Um, so there might be an opportunity as opposed to a hook for a chapter, maybe you confuse them right out of the gate. So if we think about what happens with brain-based learning, part of this involves some um, metacognitive activities. Some of this involves some sort of check-in to make sure that students are understanding. We're, we're basically labeling this checking for understanding. And this is basically, are students really getting what you're talking about? Um, this might be uh, a quick think, pair, share, or a turn and talk. You could have students do a quick one minute paper. Uh, they can make hand prints or hand signals. Um, you can uh, have them hold up uh, different objects, triangle, square, circle, to show whether or not they understand or are on the same page as you. Um, have them rate their work. So maybe they have different, different samples of work and you want them to rate their best or uh, stuff that needs improvement. You can have question boxes in the classroom. We see different online tools like Kahoot uh, that can be used to quickly check in and have a formative assessment with students to see if they're getting it. But, but generally we want to provide opportunities, embed opportunities for students to let us know whether or not they're following along. The third principle in brain-based learning um, basically has a focus on the student making learning valuable to and connecting it to students. There's this general mindset that if the information is relevant to me, if it's relevant to my group or my world or my family or my community, if it's important, if I think it's important, then I am most likely to remember, most likely to process at a more efficient and deeper level, and I'm going to most likely be motivated and care about this. So we're going to move learning into long-term uh, storage. The challenge is not everything that we learn in our classrooms, students believe is eminently going to be relevant to them. So it is our job as a classroom teacher to beg, borrow, steal, tap dance, sell, whatever it takes to make those connections for students on everything that we do. At no point should we just say, we need to read this because it's in the curriculum. We need to read this because I said so. We need to learn this because the state says that we have to learn it. If your students don't think that you're excited by it, how do you expect your students to be excited about this and want to learn it? So part of teaching is some smoke and mirrors and part is theatrics and you have to sell it 99% of the time. And that's more important as you move into fourth, fifth grade and on up. Um, as students move into adolescence, their belief about what is relevant to them in their world is modified, should we say, by adolescence. What does this look like in the classroom? Um, very simply, ex present the task and explain students why it's meaningful. Why are we doing this? Is it just busy work? Because I don't like busy work any more than you do. Uh, why is this meaningful? Why are we doing this? What's the purpose of this? Make your learning goals clear. Make your learning objectives clear. Explain why you're doing something. And if you don't know why you're doing something, you don't know why you're presenting that task, why are you doing it? Um, explain to students where they're going, what's expected, what are they going to learn, what are they going to have done at the end of this unit or theme. Um, give them an agenda or an outline of the objectives. Where are we headed? We're on a trip together. Um, one of the uh, famous gotcha questions uh, that administrators have when they come observe you in your classroom is the administrator will come over and say, well, what are you learning today? And you're a great teacher. And so you frequently explain to students what they're learning and your students are on task. And, and then, you know, you, the student explains exactly what they're learning and you're very happy. And then the administrator says, why? And then the student's dumbfounded and you're dumbfounded. Um, and so we want to really think about the, not just the, what are we learning? We want to think about the why, 
Uh, we want to think about the how, and we want to make that explicit to our students. Yes, because you might have an observation, you might have an administrator come in, but more importantly, you want to make this meaningful for your students. You want to value their time as much as they value yours. Um, what this also means is that we want to summarize main ideas, we want to make new information uh, relevant to students, and so you want to have closure every day. Every chunk of content or every day you want to have closure. Um, when you go home tonight, ask your parents about this. Next time you go to the grocery store, look for that. Next time you turn on the TV, look for this. Um, today we learn this, tomorrow we're going to do that. Um, you want to have closure and summarization so you tie the, the knots together. Uh, tie the strings together, I should say, and make it explicit for students. Principle number four in brain-based learning. Generally, learning is maximized when students feel a sense of belongingness in the school environment. We've talked about this multiple times already. We know that bullying is a plague um, and that it's one of those elements that really negatively impacts the bullier and the bully -y. Um, and so we want to find opportunities to create a sense of belongingness and ownership in the classroom. So how does that work? You want to give students multiple opportunities to connect with one another and you possibly want to give them opportunities to connect with you. You want to think about um, relationships in the classroom. You want to think about um, sort of documenting your relationships in the classroom. You want to think about and celebrate accomplishments in the classroom. You want to uh, think about peer buddies and peer mentors. Uh, in earlier chapters, we talked about, um, you know, a, a student ambassador or an ombudsman in the classroom. You want to think about um, that individual that can be there to guide new uh, individuals. But then also, if there is a challenge in the classroom, you might go to that classroom mentor, that classroom guide and ask what the uh, next step should be if we're dealing with some struggle in the classroom. You want to think about uh, adult to adult, parent to parent, child to child, child to parent relationships and how these impact the classroom, either positively and or negatively. Um, and you want to think about different approaches in the classroom. You want to think about the role of authority, uh, the role of ownership, and as we've talked about uh, quite often, the role of power in our learning environments. So if we think about the brain is an organism, um, is an organism, is a organ that is changing and can show evidence of growth, we want to think about what does it mean to teach and focus on changing brains. Um, so we might have a student that reads the class, after, reads the textbook, can't really make sense of the problems. Um, what we might do differently is to assist that first student, we might have some more problem solving activities in class and out of class. So we're going to really work on those problems and try to find new opportunities to deal with those problems and make sense of it. We might have a student that has trouble seeing uh, the theme of an area or the big picture of a block of content um, when they are looking online and reading or maybe they're in their books, they're pretty much highlighting everything because everything is important. Um, the way to help that student is first off, activate prior knowledge, show them what they've already learned and connect this new area to that so that they can see the interrelationships. We also want to think about those mind maps that we, we indicated before. We want to think about concept maps to allow students to see the bigger uh, connections between details. And more important there is the way that some of these ideas cluster and clump together. Um, if you have a, a student that is uh, generally bored, doesn't really like um, feel like there's a lot of interest in what they're studying, uh, if you have a student that just seems very low energy and not excited to be there and not really uh, feeling like it was that that child is a part of the learning process, that's an opportunity to bring in some problem or project based learning, some student interest. Um, student inquiry, uh, use the student interest to guide and facilitate motivation in the classroom, ask the students what they want to learn, and use that as the area of focus in upcoming lessons and activities. Lastly, you might have a student that um, is feeling isolated, they perform 
uh, poorly in classes. They're very excited and energetic. Um, there's a lot of emotion involved in the situation. You might want to bring in culturally relevant examples, mainly to tie into those emotional stimuli uh, to help the child connect. Um, so just some different ways to think about changing the brain um, as we relate to uh, stressors in the classroom. Principle number five, as we think about brain-based learning, periodic breaks allow us to refocus. Um, we need time to stop and process. Um, every night we need sleep so that our brain can sort of clear out uh, the old information and process and make sense of what happened that day. Uh, we need those breaks in our classrooms as well. Um, we don't learn by constantly uh, going back to the content again and again and again and again. Um, we need time to refocus. We need time to stop. We need time to take a breath. We need to allow the blood to get back to the different cortexes of the brain and uh, make sense of what we learned and prepare for new uh, knowledge. So what does this mean? Um, get up and move. Um, right now you've been listening to this video for about 36 minutes. Uh, that's way too long. Uh, get up and move, get out and stretch, do a little exercise, maybe have the quicks quick, the kids quickly line up, you know, line up by your birthday, line up by, uh, all the people that have cats in the front of the line, all the people that have dogs in the back of the line. Um, maybe go for a walk around campus. Let's find different colors or shapes. Um, let's find examples of text in our building. Let's go outside and find examples of math um, outside. Let's find examples of geometry outside as we walk around the school. Um, have a dance party. Have a dance party. Get up. Dance around. Uh, get your kids moving. Get blood pumping. Uh, sort of flush those synapses and, and those uh, hemispheres with some fresh blood, um, get kids up and moving around, and hopefully you're using clean dance music. Um, in terms of moving and grooving, opportunities to bring dance into the classroom and especially music into the classroom at all points, I believe. I play music in my classroom pretty much all the time. Um, I like to when I was teaching, I would have a series of playlists ready to go um, that I could access at the at, at the snap of a finger, um, and I would play different types of music. Most of the music was uh, without words, um, so that students could focus. Some of it had words. A lot of it was music the students had never heard before, or they would say, my dad listens to that, uh, or my grandfather listened to that. Um, so I would play different types of music, and I think that Music has a good opportunity to connect learners and help people engage. It might be an opening activity, the way you start class. It might be during math, maybe during art. We always play some music when we're doing art in class. Um, it could be in our literacy block when we, uh, when we read, it is silent, but when we write, maybe I play some jazz or something. Um, when we're moving around, uh, when we have cleanup, uh, maybe I'll play a song that's our cleanup song. Um, maybe if they did great work, I'll play some music. Um, you know, lots of opportunities to bring music into the classroom. And one of the really fun things is that you can use this as a way to connect with your learners. You can play music that you like and, and you want to share it with them. You might ask them what music they like or they hear at home. You might ask them what music they like and they want to bring in. Obviously, once again, you're going to want to make sure that it is clean and school appropriate um, because nobody likes that phone call from home. So to wrap things up when we think about brain-based learning, first off, We've said this multiple times. We want to make the learning, make the information relevant to student lives. We want students to feel welcomed and valued in our classroom. We want them to feel like they are a meaningful component, a valued component of our class. We want to give our kids opportunities to practice. Um, we want them to learn something new and not just expect that they are an expert in it now. We need to give them the same privileges that you expect 
you learn through practice. Um, this helps them see patterns in what they are learning. If they keep practicing it, they build automaticity, it comes easier, they focus less on the actual practice and more on the larger concepts involved. And we also want to build in brain breaks. Um, we want to remember that the brain uh, keeps what it is using useful and interesting and the stuff that we don't really care about it sort of uh, filters out and throws away over time and it sort of ignores the other information so hopefully all is well with you hopefully you are doing well and i'll look forward to talking about more of this in the next chapter